Hey guys, I'm Dan Cattell. I do art. My handle is Dan Cattell Art. I've been doing panels for the last few years on things like Metroid and Zelda, but I've heard a lot of requests for me to talk about my unique retro gaming costumes. So this is the first year speaking about myself at length as a panelist, which to be honest, kind of weird. So my gaming history. This is the CRT in my classic gaming room that I've been setting up in my new house, you know, for research. I'm 32. I grew up in the 90s at first with the Sega Genesis, so saving your gaming progress seemed absolutely alien to me when I had occasional experiences with NES, Super NES, and N64 before owning Nintendo consoles for myself. After Pokemon came out, I got me a Game Boy Color and then bought an N64 and Smash Bros, and I was set up to be a Nintendo guy for life. In the five years before debuting the first Pixel costume, I'd already been to about three or four Otakons starting in 2005, where I went with Link's starting outfit from The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. This was before the game was even delayed, so it wasn't coming out for a year and a half, and almost nobody seemed to know who I was. Cosplay and online shopping were still sort of in their infancy, and I didn't have a wig or ears or props, which didn't help with recognition. Of course, I did eventually make that happen as I got more into cosplay. But that's enough intro. I'm going to show you the pixel costumes that I've made in the last decade, and then I'll loop back around to the mindset of inventing them. Flash forward to college. When I came up with my first pixelated costume, I was a student at Rutgers for computer animation and generally just experimenting around in the arts. Here's the Chozo. Uh, that debuted in Odukan 2010 in Baltimore. The big thing that I did differently on this one compared to everything afterward is that I tried to abstract out the pixels when I painted. I did the whole thing to a grid, but then I rounded out the shapes and colors. I figured it might look better, uh, and being expressive about it would definitely be easier than painting the many little squares. Proportion study in animation software is how I figured out how to make this for the first time. Uh, here we have an orthographic view that gives you a sense of how I investigated getting the character joints to line up with mine. That final scaling gives me an inch to pixel ratio that lets me know how big to blow it up. Uh, I considered doing a low relief sculptural element by layering cardboard, but then that started to sound like a lot of work and might be bumping the lamp for something that might not even look any better. Uh, I considered some other ideas like glow-in-the-dark paints, and I had plans for lots of fancy animation tricks in the head, the wrists, the toes, that didn't make it into the final. Uh, but before putting this panel together, I, I was sort of uh, considering a revisit. Maybe I'll get back to that and try them out. Uh, here we have some photos from OC Remix, my first time on stage for a panel. That was still 2010. My friends and I didn't really take any photos or video of the outfits in the early years. But uh, I'd always just plan to go online afterward and see what kind of uh, photos I could find in the hall shots from various photographers. This is the only video that I have from that year. Uh, yes, we shot it on a potato. These were the baby steps my first movement performance in 2D cosplay. Um, you can compare it with the game animation, which I studied closely. Uh, when I got back to our hotel room that night, like I said, this was 2010, and I didn't have a smartphone yet. I went online with my Wii web browser that I brought along to the hotel. Uh, I ego-searched my costume on Google and found the Chozo at the top of a new cosplay blog post. One of my friends got really excited and said that I was internet famous now, which is funny to me. Uh, but people still re make that remark, and it still sounds like a joke every time. Uh, in the video, you can see what the costume looks like from the front. Uh, lots of internet denizens wonder about that and ask me all the time. Uh, I planned to wear all black, but I spaced out during the hectic hotel prep. Uh, a little bonus fact, my online message board handle back then was Chozo Boy for at least uh, eight years before I made this, including on DeviantArt. Uh, next year, we had uh, Samus. Uh, Photocon 2011. Samus was the next logical step. I'd actually made the Chozo as tall as my proportions would allow because I knew that I'd want to do an accompanying Samus next. The Chozo didn't make his intended appearance with her that year. 
uh, because I could barely handle coordinating one untested, freshly debuted Samus costume, and I couldn't really be a good handler uh, if I had my outfit on as well. With the Chozo, I had been abstracting out the pixels, but people still called it a pixel monster anyway. I knew that if my audience was seeing pixels that weren't necessarily there, it's because they wanted to see them, and I needed to give them what they wanted. This time, the costume really exploded online. I made the front page of Reddit for the first time. I got into articles on a bunch of sites. Online commenters often didn't really connect the word cosplay in the title to what they were looking at in the photo. A few even insisted to me that the photos were fake, and uh, here I realized that I had a weird problem that I'd never considered before. Even with all of the flaws that I could see in my own art in the photographic illusion, it had become too good for the average person. Even when I explained that it's a costume, it often didn't click, and I didn't yet have a presentational solution to that. Here's a photo. I crashed a Minecraft group uh, when I didn't even know what Minecraft was in 2011 yet. <laughs> the biggest thing that happened to me that year was I was contacted to be in Nintendo Power magazine. I was born during the first issue launch of If the Magazine Run, so I was thrilled to get to be a part of that legacy. In this publication, uh, I debuted the portmanteau that I came up with to describe my new idea, Cospix, short for cosplay and pixel. As unveiled in the article, clearly the next thing that I needed to make was Ridley to scale with my Samus in 2012. I was doing my animation thesis work to graduate at the time, so life was crazy, and painting Ridley did not help. What he did help was applying for a research grant. I sent them a copy of the Nintendo Power article, described what I wanted to do, called it sculpture, and they gave me money. And that funded the whole thing plus my Oticon tab for the year. Here's some rare footage of the painting process that I usually don't share because I have a slightly better quality version probably locked up in some old broken hard drive. This is worn by Steve Scoofless at Otacon 2012. You can always rely on Steve, and he was tall enough to fit the bill. Bringing the parts uh, to con to set up was a bigger ordeal than I expected, and I expected quite a bit. The second side, uh, you know, there's a right and a left, ultimately left in the car. Uh, didn't get most of the planned mobility down that I wanted to do. Um, Ridley was so big, he was eventually kicked out of the lobby. Uh, and uh, I set him back up on the top floor. Um, we had this little um, escalator incident where when we're heading down with the costume, Steve in it, uh, there's a big drop in the ceiling, a little a right angle that comes down real low, and uh, we had to have Ridley angle over and duck to the side real fast. And, uh, you know, it kind of reminded me of the Jurassic Park scene where they had to duck uh, under the tree branch while they're driving away from the T-Rex. And everybody applauded when it narrowly averted an enormous catastrophe to the costume. Um, and shortly after that, he was kicked out of the convention center. Uh, so before I went, I, I checked on the rules for costume sizes. They had rules about, uh, oversized props, but not oversized costumes. But the Otakon staff said that the crowd forming around him was a fire hazard. So I brought him outside, uh, to hang out with the ice cold water guy for a little while. 
After that, I had him in the Stedman Gallery at Rutgers as part of the thesis show. On display, I had him hanging from mounting brackets so we would pop off and give the wall a cool pixelated shadow look. The final run of the community section in Nintendo Power's uh, second to last issue um, is my second publication with him. The next year, 2013, I had an error costume. He was my first 8-bit NES outfit. And the Super Nintendo, of course, is 16-bit. Uh, never wore this one to a con, actually, but I took it out a few times to some different events and sold it to the group that used to be called Street Press Prints and, and now goes by the name Ninja. These photos were from the Princeton campus with one of my oldest AOL and Sim Messenger friends that your parents would tell you not to go meet. Error was a lot of fun. Following up on that, my next ambitious project was Mario Riding Yoshi in 2014. Uh, this is my second time using time lapse, which was awesome and hypnotic, uh, and gives you a lot of extra content for your effort. But it also takes some more work to set up and keep tabs on. Uh, I was still pretty exhausted with Ridley, but uh, I never finished the Mario parts, so I never wore it out. Uh, I brought it out to display in some gaming art show in Brooklyn, and then basically left it in my basement in a garbage bag for something like four or five years. Uh, we'll come back to that one in a little bit. Cosplay, I kind of put it on hold for a while because it was stressing me out a little, and I was doubting my ability to do it on my own a lot, especially dealing with uh, how to best attach the panels to my body without an outside set of eyes, but also without having a handler at each con. It seemed to be something that ought to be simple, but it really took me years of experimenting and failing to get it the illusion right, uh, the animation element of how they move to be mostly seamless and very important to be comfortable. I started vending at mostly small and local cons, and I came up with an on-brand idea to sell pixelated sculpture, wearable things, clocks, uh, which became my biggest item. I was really into kinetic sculpture and broadly the idea of commingling the game world with ours. In that vein, I also made several pokedex height Pokemon sculptures and masks and little bottle charms with different characters and pixels, little fairies and things. Uh, trying to get some momentum back into cosplay after scaling down and stepping away for a few years, I started working on the Stormtrooper from Super Star Wars on the Super Nintendo. Uh, I took a stab at getting back into it and started painting cardboard, but wasn't able to get enough steam to push through. Flash forward to 2017, I was inspired by other cosplay groups like the 501st Star Wars charity group I'd known about for years, and I'd seen the Fire Emblem community meet up in their Facebook group. So I pushed forward and kicked off Metroid Cosplay, the Samus Squad, and uh, we put together a big collaboration video. I found a friend who was the right size for the Samus costume, fixed it up better than it had ever been, with a fresh coat of plaid paint and new elastic attachments. At some point in the intervening time, I'd also realized a solution for the photographic illusion being too good, and that was video. In the years since 2011, many of us now had a presentable video camera on our phones. Uh, 
for the first time. Uh, there was one more piece to that presentation, but I'd figure out a year later. Here's the Silver Space Pirate, debuted at Katsukan 2018. I couldn't decide on which color to make it, so I put it up to the Metroid cosplay community and got a few opinions there. Uh, this sort of became my signature costume. The favorite part here for me is the claw action at the elbow, which is ridiculously simple in design, uh, but it gets a lot of confused comments from people asking how I did that. Uh, I was motivated to do this character from my time as the Chozo because people would call that a space pirate, but when I did the space pirate, people would call it a Chozo, so sometimes you can't win. This is a little trick that I came up with here. Uh, when I noticed the costume was too skinny, and I was worried that the legs might be too long and the body too squat when you line up the shoulder and elbow. Learning about pixel ratios, uh, I learned that the Super NES outputs at 8 to 7 aspect ratio, and CRT displays uh, at 4 to 3 aspect ratio. Uh, there's a huge debate about which one is uh, the best presentation, but in my opinion, the best way is to look at circles and spheres and things like that to figure out what the intended aspect ratio is for uh, the developer side of it. Um, or rotating characters, like when you see Mario running up a wall. Uh, but that's you know really technical, and you can check out My Life in Gaming to learn about stuff like that. But what this amounts to is that using pixels which aren't exactly square gave me the bit of wiggle room that I needed to be able to hide behind the character art. This video was taken at Too Many Games, uh, same year, by uh, Charles Martinet. And this one's a local annual event in the Philadelphia area. And Charles is the voice of Mario and Luigi, and he's absolutely delightful. Uh, this is my first time doing the spin transformation which was the final puzzle piece in making it a proper transformation illusion that works well for the online audience. This is the Otakon video from 2018. Uh, one of the most widely circulated videos of me ended up on the front page of Reddit a couple times and our gaming. Uh, even though I'd made the costume half a year earlier and brought it to several cons in that time, sometimes there's a lag before your cosplay blows up on the internet and it just needs the right footage. It also helped that I'd been practicing the movements in that intervening time and reviewing footage for after each con and making tweaks to the attachment and generally doing a lot of learning about how to move in it and look good. Each outfit has a different muscle memory for me that I have to tap into, which I'm sure uh, uh, most armor cosplayers are familiar with. I'm often asked about why I don't do two sides by fans who don't realize that most of my outfits have two sides created for them from the start, and that has a lot to do with how it's hard to enjoy the event and socialize, but also hard to repair it if there's any problems, it's harder to move, and the illusion is slightly worse, and now I only wear two sides at the same time for special occasions like parades. That said, I did have the intention to do another red color palette for the left side of the space pirate, but predictably ran out of time from painting the last minute. Uh, I also did an interview with Insider at New York Comic Con that got at least a few million views right off the bat and ended up being a pretty big deal because now people quote me at myself when they meet me. That's a thing. So just to recap on the media used up to this point, uh, the Chozo and Samus costumes were plaid paint on cardboard, the Ridley Dragon costume, my third one with the research grant, uh, got me plaid paint on canvas on Coroplast, which is a plastic cardboard like you see in lawn signs. Error and Yoshi were a return to plaid paint on uh, cardboard and then with the silver space pirate I used plaid paint on poster board adhered to coroplast um, which uh, it had some stuff going for it but I was never too great with figuring out the adhesives and uh, that poster board kept buckling and undoing itself um, so I continued experimenting on from there. 
Next, I brought the space part out to Franklin Institute's 8-bit night in Philadelphia. Uh, I ended up talking to the staff there, and they wanted a Minecraft mascot character for their Minecraft event that summer. So I got to doing the math and figured out a way to make the most accurate Steve costume ever produced in terms of not compromising on the joints or feet. It was exactly to scale with the game world's definition of each block being one meter. The kids loved it and we did photo ops, but moving and seeing were kind of harsh uh, in this mascot outfit. To get the face accurate without holes, I designed it so that I'd be looking out of the chin. Steve's taller than you might expect and can't fit through average doorways, so we needed a curtained area to maintain the illusion. Following this, someone wanted to know if I could do a Yoshi. I sort of laughed to myself, uh, remembering that I'd made Yoshi years ago, and all at once realized that I didn't need Mario to use the rest of the costume if I sat on him myself, using the ancient flamingo art of standing on one foot. Another really simple illusion, but it still shocks people who ask for a photo and want to know how do I do that. Uh, this is my trial run at the after party for Retro Game Con in upstate New York. I got the neck and everything to work better afterward, but I still have more ideas for him. The Red Space Pirate debuted at Katsukon 2018, this time switching to another medium, a vinyl decal. It was a little scary to switch media or production techniques, but I got to where I am by experimenting each time and failing in small ways a whole lot. But this came with a bigger cost and new unknowns. One of the big issues that I had with vinyl cause picks that I predicted might be a problem was specular reflection on the plastic messing with the illusion. The plaid paints that I've used up until this point are very matte and never had this problem but I got a recommendation to tone down the reflection with several light coats of matte spray. Switching to print also has the increased cost factor that I mentioned earlier, and that goes against my initial creation philosophy of trying to do this without breaking the bank. But I knew that there was increasing demand from customers who all wanted their own cosplays. For Halloween 2019, I wore the painted silver and red sides together for a parade for the first time. These costumes are perfect for parades because the audience is always in the optimal viewing angle. And there was no way that I'd be able to handle painting that many orders for you all. So the first vinyl experiment was in order. There's the added benefit that these entirely plastic costumes are waterproof now. So I've been wanting to take a photo out in the rain or do a video in a pool or the ocean or something. So keep posted for those. I haven't painted a costume since this one, but I'm definitely thinking about returning to it for a few to-do cos picks that are hanging out in my pipeline. Next that year, I was contacted by Smiley, a popular Romanian musician who wanted a cos picks designed to look like him for his song about nothing music video that we went out and filmed in Los Angeles. The illusion was back to being too good for a lot of the audience in this music video because the director added pixel animation on top of it. And because I never got to do my turn transformation in the video, most of the commenters online didn't seem to pick up that it was one of my costumes. The song is a bop though. This rooftop setting is on a film studio and uh, they mentioned that Mr. Miyagi's house was inside. In the shots where uh, the character is not wearing a hat, we had a professional dancer performer in the costume, and I'd uh, stand next to the camera and uh, sort of go over to him and give him advice uh, on how to look his best. And uh, once his time was up, I stepped in, and all of my shots, you'll notice I'm wearing the hat on the character. Actually, I was kind of worried uh, when I got the gig in an email. Uh, they mentioned that the unreleased song was attached to the email file. And uh, I had this moment of worrying where I thought, oh no, if, if I open up this attachment and the song's terrible, I'm not going to be able to take the job because you know, I, I wouldn't want to be attached to something that I didn't like. But you know, it all worked out well. The song's really cool. And I enjoy listening to it. The guy on screen here is an actor, but uh, moments before production, 
paid to borrow that cart from a nearby homeless person. The cart has a lot of character with that weird mannequin head. In the video, we have a married couple uh, that was improvised uh, on site when we ran into them out getting their photos. All of the location scouting for the music video was done beforehand, uh, before I'd gotten there. Uh, it was my first time on the West Coast over in California, first time seeing the Pacific Ocean, which we shot at the end of the video. Um, you'll notice when I talk about uh, doing any kind of work with my costumes, I use the Royal We a lot. Um, I always like to give lots of credit to uh, all of the other people who help out, and even people who talk to me and bounce ideas off. Uh, you know, being an artist is... It's, it's not a, a solitary person in a room who comes up with ideas straight out of their brain. Um, being an artist is, uh, it's communication, it's, uh, it's learning, and it's uh, experimenting, and it's never just a singular mind. We're always reacting to the people around us, the people who came before us. Uh, every artist is standing on the shoulders of those who we've all appreciated, those who we've thought we could do better than. Being an artist is being part of a community. It's it's important to never forget that, because that's what's going to help you succeed. And then I got around to doing that Stormtrooper. Most of the stuff that I've done are from the Metroid series. Do you want one of these costumes? Uh, I wanted to get in on Star Wars photo shoots, so this was a must. All right, man, load your weapon. And it was my first time doing the inside thigh piece. That is the thigh that's further away from the camera. The previous costumes didn't have one. sometimes get crazy and mix things up. Spidey from Spider-Man and Venom Maximum Carnage uh, debuted at J1Con in Atlantic City 2019. Uh, I added a webbing prop at KatsuCon right after that and right before the pandemic started. 
I've been working on a firing mechanism to thwip pixel webbing, but it still has some kinks in it. And this is the first costume that has the inside bicep. Uh, that is, again, the bicep that's further away from the camera. This costume, or rather the character, is in a three-quarter perspective compared to the other characters. So I can't just stand sideways like usual because you can see my shoulders are on either side of my head. Uh, so I have to contort a little bit to make that work. Uh, it's a little bit less comfortable and man, this character's got some wacky proportions. But with this build, I was finally able to get in on more superhero and Marvel photo shoots. And most importantly, I was just recently able to join a few cosplay groups who do charity work. Shout out to the Philly Avengers and everyone else using their talents to make the world a better place. If you're really into cosplay, I recommend teaming up with someone who has a background in charity because there's a lot of mistakes that you can make uh, if you just try to wing it yourself. It's surprisingly involved, but definitely worth it. Can you dab in that thing? How high can you raise your arms? Oh. <laughs> can you jump? Okay, <laughs> probably not. Going back to 2009, as I was formulating the idea, the question I'm often asked is, what inspired you to make these? So I loved cool cosplay and definitely the con community, but I knew I couldn't really compete directly with the pros that I see online or at the convention, either in fabric or in armor. I didn't have a background in sewing or fabrication, uh, but I'd been honing my creativity and my eyes as an artist for years. I wanted to succeed by innovating, rather than dropping a bunch of dough that a jobless college kid with loans around the corner doesn't have. A big light bulb moment for me when I was looking at a blog for a cosplayer who made a District 9 prawn costume out of cardboard. Looking at the process photos in the post, I realized that I could overcome my cost hurdle with inexpensive and unintimidating materials like paint and cardboard too. Picasso was a big influence on me for a long time. I was really obsessed and uh, spent my early college years comparing analytical cubism, the early brown ones that tried to depict all of the planes of an object simultaneously, versus his synthetic cubist works which were my favorites, uh, that were colorful and tried to depict the flattening of a dimensional subject. That said, as fantastic as he was, he had some sort of disdain for computers, and uh, he probably wouldn't have thought much of the future of computer arts or what we now have, the gaming industry, animation, uh, graphic design, and all that jazz. Uh, he also really didn't like the moon landing either, I don't think he uh, really cared for anything that drew attention away from himself and uh, his art canon. Another thing I learned about in 2009 was Alexa Mead's uh, optical illusion work where she paints directly on people. Spriter's Resource uh, was a big influence on me for many years, which has a great library of retro gaming sprites. And I was also inspired by digital artists who shopped voxel characters into photos in the 2000s. I bet many of you made these paper and brass pin puppets as a kid. Conceptually, my cospics are the same thing, but scaled up to costume size and using anatomy instead of pins. Like I mentioned earlier, I was going to school for animation. Most 3D animators are eager to create a digital thing that looks real. This is what the audience of animation is most likely to respect, uh, that is, realistic computer animation. 
with my costumes, I aimed for the converse and tried to make something real look digital. Also related to animation, I've always been fascinated by basic geometry and geometric transformations, specifically rotation and translation for my costumes. I love imagining things in different numbered dimensions, like how Carl Sagan talked about in Cosmos. Uh, when I was coming up with this panel, I remembered that before I'd started making these, I'd once done a drawing of what a biological organism might look like in 2D universe, so that it lived in a circle instead of a sphere, and it was kind of like a cross-section between a starfish, and it would rotate end over end, sort of like a triskelion. I also grew up obsessed with optical illusions, fantasy, biomechanics, and most of the time when I create art, it's because some of my personal interests meet at a crossroad in an unusual way in my head. I definitely recommend to any artist that you try to learn as much about whatever it is that you love because there's no telling how you might be able to draw from that pool of knowledge later on and your work will be better for it. I've always considered myself a mixed media or multimedia artist and experimented with tons of different ideas with varying degrees of success before inventing these. And only after I realized that I was touching a nerve with so many people in a significant way, that's what told me there was more to be explored here and I'd found a visually distinct niche, which is what most artists really strive to create for themselves. One of the big questions that I get all the time is, did you invent this idea? And I think just about every creative person knows the feeling when you come up with a really cool original idea and you're a little afraid to Google it because you don't want to find out that someone else has had the thought first. And I waited a little while, but eventually I tried my Google Foo, I think after I'd done the Samus, to see if anyone had done anything similar before me. And I found someone did a, a voxelated Donkey Kong that was done a year before mine. Uh, if you don't know the difference between a voxel and a pixel, voxels are made out of cubes, while pixels are squares. Uh, so this has a similar base idea, but they weren't trying to make it a 2D illusion. It looked a little more like the DK in the Adam Sandler movie Pixels, which was also a movie about voxels, uh, and also probably a movie better to watch with the volume off. Uh, in 2019, a fan asked if I'd seen this foreign ballet performance before. I had trouble getting information about it, but it seems to have debuted uh, just before I was born. Uh, and also something I wasn't aware of at the time that I'd created my stuff. But maybe you can see there's some similarities in there. Uh, in one of my online interviews, I mentioned that the body puppets were invented in Africa thousands of years ago. And similarly, paper puppets uh, or shadow puppets in Asia. Um, and that my costumes were some of the first to uh, coordinate both of those concepts together. But a fan sent me this video last year uh, of somebody who did costumes uh, as a shadow puppet performance so that you're looking at the shadows. And uh, there's, there's a bit of similarity there. Another big question that I get asked a lot is, do you still do normal cosplay? And the answer is, heck yeah I do. Uh, some people are surprised by this and say, Whoa, I didn't know you did that, or I couldn't recognize you without cardboard stuck to your face. Uh, but you shouldn't be too surprised because all cosplayers are shapeshifters, of course, and even when we usually have uh, trouble recognizing our own friends in the community, even if they're standing right in front of us uh, just because they're wearing some new look. Uh, another question I get asked often is, Can I buy one of these? And as I suggested earlier, uh, the most important thing that I want you to take away from this panel is yes, most of these costumes are available on my online store, uh, custom to your exact height. Even better, you can just direct message me and uh, I can get that right to you. Yeah, I'm also open to commissions for characters that I haven't designed for yet. Another big question I get asked often is, uh, 
Are you worried about people stealing your idea? And by and large, I don't really care as long as they aren't profiting off of it or taking credit for the concept. Uh, I get people who are fans uh, make their own sometimes and they'll contact me beforehand or afterward to show off what they've done. And that's pretty cool. Uh, a lot of those are international fans and uh, it's nice to see the pixel invasion spreading throughout the world. You might be wondering, what's next? Well, I've still got a lot of ideas, and there's some new animation concept that I've got that I want to test out. And definitely a lot of characters that have been requested, and uh, I think there's a lot more that I could do to push this new art form. Have you guessed what I'm working on here yet? Thanks for watching guys, till next time.